There are seven heavens in Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm not just talking about the seven mountains of Mount Celestia, no. I'm talking about the seven planes of good within the cosmology of D&D. We got Arcadia, Mount Celestia, Bitopia, Elysium, the Beastlands, Arborea, and Isgard. We've already done a few videos covering Mount Celestia, which you can find here, and of course you can count our video on Muradin as well, since the chief god of the dwarves also lives within Mount Celestia, so it's all just one big nice package. Today, though, we're talking about another heaven, we're talking about Bitopia, considered to be what they call a realm of conflict, meaning it sits squarely between the planes of law and the planes of chaos. Many who play and seek to understand the concept of alignment in Dungeons and Dragons, they shun it for different reasons, but by far the biggest reason is because of the arbitrary notion of what is good and what is evil. You know, trying to define exactly what it means to be good or whether evil is this or evil is that, it can be a subjective nightmare, but when it comes to the uh, building blocks of a world, there are concepts that are more grounded in objective reality. And one of those concepts is the duality between order and disorder, or of the random versus the systematic. These are planes that exist in between the uh, rigid natures of the planes of law and the more casual or sometimes erratic natures of the planes of chaos. But before we go and explore all of these crazy philosophical concepts within Dungeons and Dragons, I should first tell you, this video is brought to you by Quest Haven. Play Dungeons and Dragons in Quest Haven, a tabletop RPG platform for any role-playing system in both PC and virtual reality. It has all the needed tools for a great adventure. Players can dive into their character and experience the world from a new perspective while seeing the map and monsters in real scale. You can battle enemies on the ground or in the air like never before. Great world building tools allow you to make large, continuous worlds and fill them with stories. You can easily grab maps made by others. Their tools allow you to control the weather, season, and lighting. Dungeon Masters will be able to immerse our players by setting the mood with music, environment, and sound effects. Bring the party together into Quest Haven where both PC and virtual reality users will be able to play cross-play seamlessly and make adventures happen. Look, I get to see a lot of Kickstarters, I, I frankly get sent a lot of Kickstarters being a YouTuber, but every once in a while I, I will look at one and I'll just say, wow, that looks awesome. <laughs> I ask you one simple thing, just just click the link below and just watch the videos, just, just look at them. Just watch the videos that they have in there and make up your own mind. I, I will just say that this is what I want. I cannot wait for the future of tabletop simulators and all the sort of things that they will be able to do, and I think that Quest Haven is an example of the beginning of that future. There is something inherently badass about turning your Dungeons & Dragons campaign into a video game, especially when you can input in all of the sound effects and music. This is like VR chat, but for Dungeons & Dragons. Guys, check them out, please. The link is in the description below. Now, back to the video. Now, Batopia as a realm is lawful good, sitting comfortable within the good spectrum, but then veering a bit towards becoming chaotic. It is essentially the last bastion of law before you surrender to the neutrality of Elysium. But what does this mean to the people that live here? Well, this means that order and law are used when it is beneficial, which happens to be, to be fair, most of the time, but it is rejected when it gets in the way. As you all know, law can be extremely helpful in the pursuit of progress, but when too strict, it'll get in the way of happiness. A king, for example, is a great representation of the concept of law. A king is an individual that sets the rules that everyone within the kingdom must follow. The problem, of course, is that the types of rules that some people within the kingdom might like, others are bound to dislike. And again, I I'm not talking about good and evil at all. I I'm talking about, for example, you know, say a community might like a king that promotes natural beauty, whereas other communities might prefer a king that promotes constructed beauty. You know, some people like parks, but then others like statues and plazas. Sometimes it is just impossible to make everyone happy, and this can be a problem with strict law. A community that exists within Mount Celestia, for example, would love kingdoms ruled by kings. In fact, they actually excel when prompted to do good by authority. And some people require prodding in order to accomplish great things, and then they feel satisfied for having done those great things. Not everyone can motivate themselves to do the things that need to be done. We can all agree on that. 
But then there are communities, for example, like the ones that live in Bytopia, that would hate kingdoms ruled by kings. Now, these people, for example, they, they would like for there to be forces that would enable and facilitate them doing good, but they don't want to be forced to do good. The people in Mount Celestia are forced to be altruistic. You know, if you have extra bread, you are supposed to give it away. And if you don't, well, the people around you are going to shun you. And you really won't be able to, philosophically speaking, climb the mountain. In Bytopia, you do not do self-sacrificial altruism. In Bytopia, you trade your extra bread. You don't give it away. To put it more into plain terms, when you go to Bytopia, what you see is a pastoral and agricultural heaven. This is the small countryside rural utopia. The small towns scattered everywhere, each self-governed with their own mayor, bustling with trade. You will find plenty of craft stores and mining towns and lumber towns and farms and orchards. You will find lone A-frame houses up in the hills, you know the idea. And this is the type of heaven for the type of person that wants to live in nature, but have also access to the facilities and conveniences of communities and towns. Now, the name Bytopia is a very clever name because it hides two metaphors within it. The first is the very comical term given to the plane, which is Bytopia, <laughs> given to it by the mercantile nature of the heaven. But the second metaphor hides within the prefix by. By is a prefix meaning having two. The word topia means place or position. So when you break down the term bytopia, it means having two places or two positions. It actually reveals the true nature of this heaven. In fact, it is literally, actually, two heavens. This here is the true form of bytopia. Bytopia has two different layers, one called Dothian and the other called Shurak who lay on each other like two breads on a sandwich. Now, Bytopia is not the only realm, of course, with multiple layers, but what makes this realm unique is that it doesn't matter where you are within the heaven, you will be able to look up and see the other layer right above you. The barrier that separates these two layers is completely and fully transparent and also traversable, so if you were to fly up, you would indeed be able to traverse that invisible barrier and cross to the other side. This is why Bytopia is also sometimes called the Twin Paradises. Now, that being said, the two layers are not actually twins, in fact, they are very different from each other. Dothian is the calm side, and here, you know, the weather tends to be very calm. Both layers have the four seasons, but those seasons happen fairly mildly in Dothian. The landscape itself is fairly smooth, the animals that you find in here tend to be generally fairly tame, uh, the same type of animals that you would find on planet Earth, for example, you would find in here, nothing too fantastical or dangerous. But then there is Shurak. In Shurak, the land is much more jagged and harsh. The mountains are steep and the temperatures vary across the seasons quite dramatically. For example, you get very hot summers and also very, very cold winters. Uh, the winds in here come in pretty strong. The rains come in pretty hard. It's like everything in nature has been tuned up. Even the animals in here, they are wilder, bigger, and certainly more dangerous. Now, the distance at which these layers are separated from one another vary dramatically across the heaven. From sea level to sea level, we're looking at a 20-mile separation. However, it is important to consider that most of these lands are hills, and so in general, uh, most of the lands are actually only separated by a single mile. So, it is in fact very easy to see the other layer from most places in Bytopia. Now, as you can imagine, the heaven has no stars and no sun or moon. Instead, uh, both sides are actually illuminated by a magical light which emanates from the border in the middle of those layers. Because of this, both layers share nights and days at the same times. Now, at night, instead of stars, because there are no stars, you instead get to see the lights coming from the houses and neighborhoods from the above layer, which, again, kind of function like stars. They look a little bit like it. Now, this feature is, of course, more substantial when you are in Shurak, since those in there get to see the more highly populated and brightly shining towns of Dothian, whereas those in Dothian will see less lights because Shurok is not quite as populated. Because throughout most of the heaven, the layers are not really separated by that long of a distance, there are in fact mountains that completely cross over the barrier into the other layer. A situation that can be very dangerous, if not fatal, to those that are not careful. See, uh, gravity works the way that you would imagine it does. You're basically pulled down to the ground of whichever layer 
layer you currently are at. And if you cross over the barrier, then you would be pulled towards the ground of that other layer. So, so if you were to climb up a mountain in Shurok and then you pass over the barrier threshold, you would fall upwards and then splash and die on the grounds of Dothian. Uh, thankfully though, there are mountains that actually connect fully from the ground of one layer to the ground at the other, and people can actually climb these mountains in order to safely make it to the other side. In fact, this is the actual normal way for people to cross the layers. At least for those that cannot fly. If you can fly, then it's just really easy. Now, the biggest of these connectors is called Center Spire, and it is supposed to be a humongous mountain with tons of tunnels and dungeons that span the entirety of the spire. Uh, because the spire is so big, and it is the most traversed out of all of the spires, the merchants that cross it have carved out into the mountain easy stairs and roads that travel all the way up and down, so climbing it in general is no big deal. It is funny though that people here actually wonder if these spires are what keep the two realms apart or if they in fact are keeping them together. Uh, many of the inhabitants of Vitopia philosophize about whether the lands are meant to naturally move away from each other or move closer and whether or not the mountains have anything to do with keeping them the way they are. And so many of them actually have nightmares about what would happen if the spires were to collapse which is a fear that all of them have. Nobody actually knows the answer, but it is interesting to think about anyways. But yeah, you can also traverse the spire from the inside through the tunnels, but it does get a bit more dangerous inside. So, okay, we need to talk about this. So, this is something that we mentioned before on our Mount Celestia video, but... A lot of people have the misconception that because these are heavens, that there aren't any dangers, and that's just not how it works. It's just how angels constantly cross over to hell in order to fight devils and you know propagate the power of good versus evil, uh, so do evil creatures cross over into these upper planes in order to take advantage of the good people of these planes. Though, to be fair, generally speaking, that doesn't happen very much in Bytopia. You know, let, let's be real, guys. This is not that big of a plane and not as important in the grand scheme of things. At the end of the day, devils that want to create chaos are probably going to attack Mount Celestia or big places like Arborea, not really Bytopia. <laughs> Just how you, as an adventurer, when you think about invading the lower planes, you're, you're honestly really just thinking about invading the Nine Hells, or maybe the Abyss. If you're being cute, then you might do something like Jehina, but generally speaking, nobody goes, hey guys, let's go invade Acheron. Like, <laughs> that's, you know, devils basically think the same. A devil that is invading the Upper Plains are gonna probably pick the Heaven of the Elves, which is Arboria, or Mount Celestia, which is where the angels are really mustered. Nobody cares about Mytopia. But yeah, Dothian is a very calm place with tons of people and trade. It is effectively a danger-free paradise. Uh, Shurok, on the other hand, is, is a lot more volatile with actually dangerous creatures. In fact, it is described as having tons of giant-sized version of traditional beasts, many of which are carnivorous and might see you as a potential prey. And so, back to my original point, uh, many of those creatures can and will lair on many of the caves that reside within the spires such as these. So, traversing the inside of Cinder Spire can be a bit tricky, so you have to keep that in mind. Dying on these heavens is a very real thing. The first thing that you need to keep in mind about the people that live here and how they exist is that they are virtually all gnomes. Like, basically 90% of them are gnomes. That is because, as you can already guess, this is the gnome heaven, or at least part of Bytopia is supposed to be the gnome heaven. Or I should say, half of Bytopia is? Or, I guess I, well, you know, it is a bit strange. See, when I say New York, you, you probably think that I'm talking about the city. If I say that I live in New York, it is very likely that you will think that I live in the city. The reality is that New York is a whole state, and it is big, and most of it is really just rural mountains. A very similar thing happens here in Bytopia, where when people say, hey, I live in Dothian, what people are going to assume is that you in fact live in the gnomish heaven of the Golden Hills, because, well, Golden Hills is really the biggest and most important thing within Dothian. So within the general population of the entirety of the Upper Plains, including the Outlands, the Dothian is basically synonymous with the Golden Hills. So what is the Golden Hills? Well, like I said before, this is where the gnomes go to heaven, or really any person that shares the alignment of this heaven. Though, if you come here and you're not a gnome, then you're, you're magically turned into a gnome. Uh, this is a process that happens to the many souls of dead peoples who make it into heaven. Uh, I should probably explain a little bit about this since we haven't really touched on heavens all that much lately. 
So when a person in any world dies, they go to the Fugue Plane to be judged by the God of Death, Kelimbor. If you are a strong follower of any particular god, then Kelimbor will send you to the realm of that god. If you instead revered multiple gods, then Kelimbor will instead send you into the plane that best fits your alignment. Then if you didn't pray to any god, or if you did but then betrayed your god, well, uh, terrible things happen to you, but we don't, we don't really have to touch on that. So, the soul of a dead person is called a petitioner, and depending on the god that you're serving, you're going to have different jobs as a petitioner. Dwarf petitioners will smith and craft, because that's that's what Muradin wants them to do. Uh, petitioners of Tempus, the god of war, will be sent to war, because that's what Tempus wants. Now, these petitioners will act just like normal people, like they're just like you and me, except for the fact that they have this yearning desire to either become one with the heaven that they inhabit, or become one with the god that they revere. That's typically the ultimate goal for any petitioner, to become one with that which they revere. But of course, uh, such a thing takes a very long time and it requires for you to uh, truly understand and accept the nature of what your god wants you to be or what the land needs you to be. And this is actually why all of the heavens in Dungeons and Dragons are not as populated as you might think they ought to be, considering that the souls of every person in every multiverse eventually ends here after they die. It's because petitioners are constantly merging with the land once they find their inner truth. Uh, petitioners can also die, by the way. You, you can stab them. <laughs> Just how you can stab devils or angels. If a petitioner dies inside of their heaven, then they either prematurely join up with the land or god, or the god resurrects them so that they can continue their journey of self-actualization. Uh, gods don't really want their petitioners to join them unless they're ready to do so. Otherwise, the gods would just kill them all. Now, if the petitioner dies outside of their heaven, then they're actually hella screwed. Uh, they basically die for reals, and there's absolutely no way to bring them back. Like, literally, not even a god can bring them back at that point. They just cease to exist. Their soul just snaps out of reality. Uh, apparently, there's only one god that can bring a petitioner back to life that has died outside of their heaven, and that's Klangadin from the Dwarvish Pantheon, but literally no one else can. So yeah, th there you have it, a little primer on petitioners, uh, and most of them here are either gnomes or creatures of other races that were then transformed into gnomes upon reaching this heaven. The god that they primarily serve here is Garl Glittergold, which is a golden-skinned gnome with beautiful gem for eyes. And for the gnomes, he's a god of many things, but primarily the god of protection, humor, trickery, gem cutting, cooperation, and smithing. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of that happening around the Golden Hills. Uh, the Golden Hills themselves are described as everything within them having this tint of gold to them. Like, the leaves have a golden shine to them, the trees are a bit golden, the, the houses reflect a bit of golden light, everything has that you know, beautiful golden glow to it, literally even the animals. Uh, none of it has any actual value, but it is beautiful nonetheless. Quote, Regardless of the time of day or the season, a gentle warm breeze always blows over the Golden Hills. The realm is in a hilly region of Bytopia, but is also dotted with woods, deep warrens, and farmland. Not only are the trees and plants golden-hued, but all the natural living things here also are tinged with gold. Gold-whiskered raccoons, golden-winged songbirds, golden-barked sentient trees, and gold-speckled butterflies are common sights to the gnome petitioners fortunate enough to wander these hillocks. While the entire area is referred to as the Golden Hills, it's actually the seven primary hills, one for each of the seven good gnome deities, that are at the heart of the realm." End quote. See, we got three hills here that we can describe. Here is the Gemstone Burrow, where Segogen, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Earthcaller, the gnomish god of Earth, lives. It is believed that the entire wealth of the gnomish pantheon is actually found within these labyrinthian tunnels. Many gnomes make the pilgrimage down into these tunnels because every gnome that does receives a permanent blessing that allows them to talk to animals that dig and burrow. Now here is the Mithril Forge, which, get this, pay attention here, this is cool. It, this is believed to hold the largest deposit of valuable minerals and metals in the multiverse. Larger than any mine owned by any dwarf god. In any world. Uh, this is the home of the gnomish god of mining and smithing, Flandel Steelskin. And just by walking atop this hill, it is said that you can feel the rumbling of mining under your very feet. In fact, those that look upon the hill from afar even claim to see the hill moving up and down in rhythm to the sounds of the mining underneath. It's really cool. Keep in mind that a, a lot of the gnomish kind of flavor is very comedic in style. One of the biggest mantras of Glitter Gold is that you're supposed to work and cooperate with each other, but always 
just make sure to keep a good nature humor to everything that you do and you can kind of sense a lot of that in this world. Then here is Whisperleaf, a name given to the hill thanks to an enormous ancient oak tree atop the hill that is of course named Whisperleaf. It is the home of the gnomish god of forest and thievery, Bearven Wild Wanderer. The forest is well known because a nun gnome that visits it always comes back missing an item. Now, there's nothing that you can do about it either, it is a godly power that just steals an item in your possession every time you leave the place. And the only way to get it back is to return to the forest and then play a prank or a practical joke upon any of the residents of the forest. If you do, the item appears back in your backpack. There's no other way to get it back. Now, what's interesting about gnomes and the petitioners that follow Garl Glittergold and the other gnomish gods is that gnomes are generally very interested in production. You know, very much like how dwarves are. But the difference between dwarves and gnomes is that gnomes are a lot more outgoing and would rather share their creations and experiences with other people. And gnomes are very focused on practical utility for their craft. Also, unlike dwarves, who really have no real love for comers, gnomes are all about comers. I mean, their god is literally this guy. Look at him. If this guy doesn't scream capitalism, then I don't know who does. He looks just like Mr. Monopoly, after all. And so, we go back to the very fun metaphor we discussed before, Bytopia being comedically called Bytopia. Uh, this heaven is effectively a libertarian capitalist utopia, where you have hundreds of thousands of crafty gnomes creating all kinds of craft and inventions, tons of farmlands producing very ingenious and effective crops, miners mining tons of beautiful gems, and then other gnomes creating gorgeous jewelry out of them and all of these items being sold in the marketplaces scattered all across the realm though primarily being sold on the biggest city of the realm called Yeomad which is here quote as the petitioners of Bytopia are primarily concerned with the production of goods Kenny planners and otter cutters with enough guts and enough jink to brave the journey supply the transport needed for the production to prosper the trading burg of Geoman is one spot on the plain where the two halves of business meet. A bustling trading burg near the center of the lair, Geoman is the place to be if a body's got something to sell or some jink to spend. Any non-evil and non-magical product, good or service, can be found for sale or barter in Geomand. If there's a place anywhere in this plane that goes all day and all night, it's Geomand. Merchant and caravan traders sit hunched over an inn's stout hand-carved oaken table, squinting at contracts and haggling over the fine points of a deal till all hours. The streets are never empty. Somebody's always unloading a wagon full of goods just in from a handy craftsman of Shurok, hitching a team of horses to haul a shipment of handcrafted items to the high ops in Sigil who can afford the caravaneer's markup, or hawking the merits of this tavern's ale or that joint's feather beds. Geomen's a great burg, but quiet it ain't. End quote. You know, it's, it's funny, there's actually a really popular spell that was created by the traders that live here, uh, just because of how much business happens. It's called Value. It's a second level wizard spell that works exactly like the Identify spell, except that it instead tells you the monetary price of a non-magical item. So you basically get to know how much something costs, so that you can then haggle properly and uh, not get swindled. It's a really cool spell. I'm actually surprised that doesn't exist in 5th edition. Now the thing to understand though is that Bytopia is not really uh, crazily industrialized. Uh, the idea of automation doesn't really seem to sit very particularly well with many gnomes who would rather work with their hands and create personalized products. They also consider the land itself sacred since after all they, they do wish their spirits to combine with the heaven at some point in the future so uh, they don't really destroy the land for the prospect of profit. You won't see many rivers being dammed or, or forests being burnt to create space for more housing, none of that stuff. Uh, the idealized nature of the gnomes in this heaven is a combined effort between the lawful nature of their communities alongside the chaotic feeling of unbothered nature. Uh, this is why this heaven sits very close to the confluence between law and chaos, though after all, siding closer to law since it is, after all, a very tamed nature that the gnomes desire for their home. No, they don't like the forest to just be wild and crazy. 
But yeah, this is meant to be a rural paradise where you can have your farm, you can go chop down a tree and no one will make a fuss about it, you can go hunt and skin the animal and then sell the pelt at the market, you can enjoy the uh, beautiful mountains and hills and there's no king or no ruler to bother you, uh, taxes don't exist in this heaven. Uh, that's the essence of this place and as it is congruent with the mentality of this type of place, uh, there are no freeloaders. Gnomes in general detest laziness. It doesn't make sense in their brain to not want to do something or, or be creative and ingenious and so non-gnomes that come over and expect free food without work are severely disappointed. On the other hand, they are very open with helping as long as you are willing to put in the work and most gnomes are more than happy to give you work if that's what you seek. Especially for adventurers, since there's tons of evil to rout and monsters to slay for adventurers seeking uh, adventure. Now, of course, much of the trading and farming happens in Dothian, since it is a much more tame landscape. Uh, Shurok is a bit wilder and so primarily is mining what happens over there. Most of the profitable mines and the rarest of pelts come from this side of Bytopia and the way they go about moving that cargo to Dothian to sell it is actually very interesting. Many caravans, of course, simply carry their cargo through Center Spire, though this is mostly for small and valuable cargo like, you know, like gems. But for heavier stuff, a, a different method is used. Gnomes, the very ingenious species that they are, have developed hot air balloons that carry their merchandise from one side of the heaven to the other. Uh, they basically prepare their balloons with exactly the right amount of heat so that it floats up towards the barrier and then it gently falls over into the other side. Uh, they design the containers to be very durable so that it can withstand very strong impacts, which of course you would expect. This is just the best. Now, let's talk a bit about some of the cool stuff that you can find in Shurok, since, well, we haven't really mentioned it too much. Uh, Shurok, or, or really all of Bytopia, but certainly mostly this side of it, is the home of one of the most powerful types of dragons that exist within the multiverse. And what's cool is that they really only live here. Uh, we're talking about the Adamantite dragons. Quote, Adamantite dragons are perhaps the mightiest of dragon kind. They are the epitome of good, sacrificing whatever is necessary for the common good of intelligent creatures everywhere. These other planar creatures are strange among dragon kind since they are born with their shining coats of adamantite fully developed. This mighty coat is a shining silver color that reflects light in brilliant scintillating beams and rainbows, refreshing to those who can bask in its goodness, painful to those who hide in the shadows of evil." End quote. Uh, these guys have by far the coolest breath weapon. So their traditional breath attack is fire, which is pretty normal, but their secondary one is a time stop breath. Yup. They breathe out a time distorting breath that forces those caught up on the radius to become dimensionally locked in a time bubble. It is, however, important to note that this particular and very powerful breath attack can only be done by the dragon while inside Bytopia. They cannot use it outside of it, which makes sense. This is really strong. Quote, The Adamantite dragons are self-appointed guardians of the Twin Paradises. These great creatures are extremely powerful and will come to the aid of any intelligent creature. It should be noted, however, that they are unconcerned with law or chaos, but only the protection of sentient life forms. Adamantite dragons have little place in the ecosystem of the Twin Paradises. They can, however, be avaricious hunters with huge appetites. Adamantite dragons have no moral objection to hunting unintelligent life forms for food." End quote. Now, the thing is, even though this is supposed to be their home, they are still extremely rare. The, the lore states that this is their home plane and that they live here, but they are so rare that the gnomes that live in Bytopia actually believe that there's probably just the one, or perhaps maybe even two at most. Uh, Planescape in particular mentions one by name called Merciala, who is only a young adamantite dragon. Though keep in mind that the adamantite dragons are so much more powerful than normal dragons that even though this particular one is only a young one, they are as strong as an ancient red or gold dragon. They are so strong. Now, another really interesting factoid about Bytopia, specifically of Shurok, is that this is in fact the home of the fabled Epimetheus. So in ancient Greek mythology, Epimetheus was a titan god of afterthought and excuses. He basically always acted before thinking. He was the brother of Prometheus. He was never imprisoned by the Greek gods like all the other titans because Epimetheus didn't fight with the other fellow titans and so he was spared. Well, he basically just roams Bytopia mindlessly without really a goal in mind. He's a titan, of course, so he's enormous and there's actually a tower that you can find in Shurok that was supposed to be his home. Uh, Epimetheus tried building himself this 
big home, but instead of building a good foundation for the house from the bottom up, he instead kept on changing his mind on how big he wanted his house to be. And so he kept on building it bigger and bigger, but from the higher up he built it. So the house ended up looking like a cone, basically. He also didn't use the same shape of stone for the walls. And so eventually the whole thing just collapsed on itself. The Titan gave up and basically just kept on mindlessly walking around the heaven, creating chaos wherever he went. I, I figured that I would mention it since it is just kind of funny. There's a Titan out there that doesn't think about anything he does and just keeps creating destruction wherever he goes. It's just funny. Uh, you can also find actually the Egyptian god Tefnut in here, a god of moisture and rainfall. She resides on a massive pyramidal mountain called Windrath. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Doc Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Benjamin Bosters, Falky951, Ordorix, Abim Kursha, Thomas Hunt, Soulless Rider, Stephen, Lost Crusader, Stalia, Treb909, Trevor Hess, The Living Guild Pack, Describe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shoddy Cast, Jesse Feliciano, Lucas Cyrek, Nakdor Ashura, Brian Camp, John Harley, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Warren Smith, Baruch, Alisa Kestrel, Kristen Coleman, Lactose the Intolerant, Holy Phi, Anakin the Wolf of Shadows, Flame Black 200, Murden Games, Falcon Scientist, Liberty or Death, and Xanoman for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for just being so awesome. Make sure to like the video, make sure to leave a comment. It always helps with the algorithm and of course, uh, check out those PDFs. It's there's literally no greater way to support me other than uh, being my delightful $25 patrons, but also um, Checking out and buying one of the PDFs. It's the best thing that you can do so like I would appreciate it so much But yeah, thank you guys for being here and I'll see you guys next time. Oh, you know what? Let's uh, let's actually do something fun for you guys who stayed up until the very end um, I'm gonna leave a poll on my on the video description so that uh, you guys can help me figure out what's going to be the next plane that I'll cover. It's going to be a collection of all of the other planes, so just pick the one you want the most for me to cover, and I'll try and go ahead and do that in the next video. Oh, and to make sure that this is really only for those of you who stayed all the way until the very end, because I know that not all of you guys do, uh, the poll is going to be at the very, very, very bottom of the description after all of the nonsense that I have in there. So, it'll be hidden from most people, but you guys... You guys are the special ones.